All right. And now I will begin uh, the, the talk of diagnosing uh, tree diseases in Maine. Um, I will be using a, a laser pointer, you can see, to sort of illustrate or to bring your attention to certain things uh, as, as the talk goes on. Um, and I'll begin now. So why are di diagnostic skills so important? Well, they're important because trees can't talk. Uh, trees can't say this is a group of flowering crabs here that are obviously doing really well. They're beautiful, very healthy. They can't say to you, hey, we feel great. There's nothing nothing wrong here. Um, whereas over here, you can't. this tree can't say, hey, I, I don't feel so good. I think there's something wrong with my roots. Um, obviously, this tree is, is not in good health. And uh, it turns out that the tree had a bacterial infection in its roots called um, called crown gall caused by the bacteria um, um, agrobacteria is the name of the bacteria i'm going to talk a little bit more about this particular situation but again wh why are diagnostic skills so important it's because there's incomplete information and that inc incomplete information um, may be withheld from a landowner it may be just stuff that we don't know because nobody was there when certain things happened we don't know in the, in the landscape or horticultural setting we don't know uh, how the tree was planted and that's very important i mean the first the first step to a healthy tree is putting it in, in the ground correctly and this doesn't apply of course the for uh, the, the the situation in a forest but and again in the um ag uh, sorry in the the homeowner setting um planting a tree properly is really important and if it's not done properly you can have uh, some some pretty obvious uh, complications. Um, what they always say is if you plant it too high, it's going to die. And if you plant it too low, it won't grow. Um, those are not only uh, good words to live by when planting trees, but you know, it's, it's a it's a good guide. You really want to hit that area right at the root collar. You want the root collar to be online or in, in the same line with the ground. And unlike in this picture, you'd, you'd want to, this is the root ball, you want to splay that root ball out. Um, a lot of times people pick up a pick a tree out of a uh, out of a pot at a nursery and plop it right into a hole that they've dug that's roughly the same dimensions of the pot that they they bought the tree and and plop it in the ground and um, without splaying out those roots in different directions it's really limits the trees access to resources and it also can lead to further problems like girdling roots when the trees grow in that same circle that they were uh, pot bound in they keep on growing and getting larger and in effect can can choke out and kill a tree but we also don't know about the weather a lot of uh, landowners aren't at their they may own forest land that's that's a fair distance away and, and maybe they only visit it a couple times a year or maybe every couple of years um, things happen um, there can be hailstorms wind storms microbursts um, there can be insect and disease things that happen uh, for a certain amount of time and then they kind of disappear and they may leave some uh, some symptoms of, of an issue or a, a problem, but um, it may not be readily apparent at that particular time. So it's an, important to have, you know, weather information if possible or to be able to locate that information when diagnosing disorders in trees. We also don't know about site history. A lot of times, um, site history can be kind of disguised or covered up in various ways by you know putting sod over the over the lawn or um, um, backfilling uh, with with dirt you don't necessarily see that there was some soil pollution maybe there was like a a wood splitter that was leaking hydraulic fluid on the on the roots on the root zone that's since been moved away uh, we don't know that you know there was an old vehicle parked there or that there was a lot of um, a lot of driving or you know other act activities that will cause you know soil compaction. Soil compaction is, is is tough on trees because roots need oxygen. The top of the tree needs carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. The the bottom of the tree, the roots need oxygen for uh, for respiration. So um, compacting compacting the soil through forestry pra practices or um, you know other things or or let's say um, adjusting the level of the soil by putting more soil over the root zone or um, you know, uh, 
inundating the, the root with the, the root zone with too much water that prevents uh, oxygen from getting to those roots and the result is dieback in the crown. So uh, a lot of times, um, yeah, human activity is, is sometimes very incompatible with uh, with healthy tree growth. So really when there's when there's construction or forestry practices, you know, we really have to keep in mind what's compatible with the trees that we're trying to grow, the trees that are important to us, um, and not just uh, think about uh, ourselves and, and what what we want and what our what our goals are. So a takeaway message here is a lot of times your tree's problem may be you. And I don't say this directly to, to landowners, but you know, I might say that they're, you know, maybe loving their trees a little bit too much. Sometimes they can get overzealous with the pruner. Um, they can do things to try to reduce weed competition, like use, uh, and I, this is a, a, an example from my, my experience. People use things like soil, excuse me, soil sterilants, um, or just, you know, broadleaf weed pro, uh, products. They may have, you know, scarred one of the roots recently with a lawnmower or a weed whacker. Then they come in, they try to control the dandelions growing under the tree and get some of that product into the tree's system and oftentimes with disastrous results. Um, herbicides need to be used very carefully around trees and uh, that's because herbicides are designed to kill green things and trees are green things. So um, very, they should be used very cautiously. So gathering information is kind of the, the theme here. If you can gather information, you have somebody to ask. Um, these are the things that you should ask. And you know, when I was uh, when I first started in my my career dealing with tree health, I used to keep a laminated card in my back pocket that had all these questions and had the steps of, of uh, diagnosing trees um, and tree disorders uh, that I'm going to be introducing here in a little bit. Um, I had that as like a guide so that I, I would remember very you know specific things that I, I wanted to uh, to ask and and make sure that I had a, the, the broadest complement of, of information that I possibly could. Um, so I'll, I'll I'm going to introduce these questions and give you give you an example uh, from my past of how these questions led to a diagnosis. So where was a tree purchased? So this is an important question because people bu can buy trees far away and bring them to Maine and try to plant them. And then they're surprised that they don't grow properly. Um, and in one situation, there was a, a, a person from that spent their winters in South Carolina. There was a nice sale on fruit trees. They bought a, uh, a honey crisp apple tree, and brought it up to Maine, and it didn't survive the first winter. And that can happen for a number of reasons. But the, que the question I had was, what was a tree's rootstock? And I don't know how much people know about uh, the nursery trade, uh, but many trees that uh, you can buy from a nur nursery are actually, you know, the, they're actually two trees. You have like, the rootstock, and then you have the, the top of the tree that's grafted onto that rootstock. And rootstocks are selected based on, you know, certain qualities. Here in the north, we select hardy rootstocks that can handle our, our, our long and cold winters. And uh, in the south, of course, they don't need as hardy rootstock. So if you have a rootstock that's not compatible with uh, and not hardy for main conditions, it doesn't matter that that honey crisp top is, is hardy for main conditions. If those roots aren't, then you're not going to have a successful tree. And the next question, when was the tree purchased? This is important because sometimes people purchase trees and they don't plant them right away. And one one uh, and this is sort of related to the next question of when did you plant the tree? So if there's too much of a gap in between when the tree was purchased and when the tree was planted, obviously there's different things that can happen. And one one case that comes to mind, um, a, a gentleman purchased some very nice trees um, and didn't have time to plant them in the fall, so he thought he'd overwinter them. So he piled some leaves around them and put them next to the shed. Uh, he planted them in the spring, I later found out, and the, the trees did not do well. Uh, they all died. and. Uh, after talking with this person for quite a long time, he finally revealed that, well, yes, I did buy them in the fall and um, I didn't get a chance to plant them and I thought they'd be fine. And obviously they weren't, they obviously uh, had some frozen roots and uh, the trees weren't successful. <coughs> Excuse me, so describe how the tree was planted. Again, this is a situation where, you know, some people will pull that plant out of a pot and stick it in the ground and think that trees grow that simply and it's just simply not the case. Um, 
you have to ask people, did you, you know, spread out the roots? Um, how big a hole did you dig? And, you know, and, and just uh, there's a lot of things that can go wrong when planting a tree. And that's why I say planting a tree right is the, the first the first best thing you can do uh, when uh, if, if you, if you want to have a healthy tree and you really want to have something that uh, it, you know, meets your expectations for for that planting. Um, symptomology, when did the first, when did you notice the first symptoms? And this is important because different diseases and different insects appear at different uh, times of the year. Uh, so noticing, or when, knowing when those first symptoms uh, appeared is, is really important in, in helping diagnose what's going on. You may not see an insect, you may not see any evidence of a, of a fungus or fungal growth, but knowing this, the, the timing of the symptomology and what those first symptoms look like, look like uh, are pr pretty important things. One example that comes to mind, and uh, excuse me for talking about pathology stuff, but I'm a pathologist, that's what I do. So I'll try to get as many insect uh, examples as possible. But uh, the tip lights that uh, white cedar um, suffer, white cedar is also called arborvitae. Um, there are two that I can think of uh, that that are very different in terms of their, their phenology. One produces symptoms late in the year, the other one that uh, uh, you see the symptoms in uh, late, late uh, spring, early summer. So even without necessarily seeing, you know, the trees in person, if you know what the symptoms are and about when they were noticed and how they're progressing, it's it's pretty more straightforward to diagnose um, what's happening. Have the symptoms gotten worse? Uh, that's can can be a, a useful um, question to ask. Questions about unusual weather. Um, Hailstorms can cause uh, fungal outbreaks uh, of cankers and. and uh, um, Stressful events, broken branches, like for straight line winds, or uh, you know, make those make trees more attractive to to insects that can uh, mass attack trees and overwhelm them. Um, those are just some some. These are a set of possible questions that you can ask, and it's important to gather this information. I kind of liken this to you know, uh, you know, being being an investigator, a, a crime scene investigator. This is not a obviously a crime, but you know. It's, it's really important to be thorough and be systematic and to use all of your senses. I mean, you you come and you look at the whole scene and you start to notice things like, OK, the fence is is the fence is not not new, so they probably haven't reset any fence posts. But I, I look at something like this and I think, OK, what is this? It looks kind of like an electrical box. Um, maybe it's uh, a new fiber optic wire that they that they they dug a line to the house from here and severed some of the roots. Um, I also noticed, gosh, this, this yard doesn't have a single weed in it. I wonder if they're using some, you know, heavier herbicides to really achieve that, that nice looking lawn. Um, so it's, it's important to look at the, the, whole, the whole scene and then to be more specific and, and uh, look at certain parts of the tree. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll spell out this process more deliberately in a little bit, but it's important to get down on your hands and knees. It, you can't just look. You've got to poke around. You've got to you got to notice the little things, even things that's like different smells. Um, there's a there's a there's a, uh, a disorder that's associated with rot called alcoholic flux. It causes certain parts of the tree to to ooze a liquid that smells sort of yeasty, a little bit boozy. Um, that that's a situation where smell comes into into a diagnose, uh, diagnosis. Um, so you got to do the detective work. You got to look at all the uh, symptoms and try to locate signs. And that's another pair of concepts that we'll talk about later. The only thing I wouldn't uh, suggest is that you taste things. It's not much to be learned from tasting trees and um, or parts of trees. And that's uh, that's something that people are just going to think is weird. They already think you're kind of strange for being a, a tree care or a tree uh, tree health professional. Uh, don't make it any worse. So this is the, the the approach of diagnosis, and this is based on the International Society of Arbor Arboriculture. Um, I used to do training for people that were trying to get their certifications in this, and so I I originally had put together um, a presentation based on that this four step four basic categories of observation. 
Um, I've made a lot of changes to it and added a lot of uh, uh, examples along the way. But uh, the four ba basic categories of observation are plan identification, site inspection, site history, things that we've already talked about a little bit, assessing the pattern of abnormality, and then in inspecting the functional parts of the tree. So those are the leaves, the branches, the root and root collar. And I also think that inspecting or looking at um, annual growth is, is something that I occasionally forget to do, but it can be very, very telling. And I'll show you some examples of that. Um, I'll show you examples of each of these different categories um, as we move along through the presentation. So species identification is extremely important, and that's because most insects and diseases are specific to the host trees that they attack, and they are even specific to the functional parts of the tree that they attack. So there's, there's not many generalists. There are some, but there's not a lot of of generalists in the insect and disease uh, community. So proper identification of species and even subspecies or variety or cultivar quickly narrows down the number of possible causes. An example of this is I, I was earlier this, uh, it was actually earlier in 2019, um, I was reading an article about a town someplace in Canada, I can't remember which, uh, which city it was. They planted a lot of a cultivar called fall gold ash which is a i think it's a, a mix between a mancana and a black ash but anyway it's a a cultivated variety of of ash tree that the cottony ash psyllid is very highly attracted to so they had street trees that were they had these ash these fall gold ash trees that they were just being hammered by uh cottony ash psyllid while their green ash and their white ash and their straight black ash weren't being touched um, so that's just an example of a, of a variety or cultivar being really attractive to a certain kind of uh, pest. Um, insect and disease issues are often regionally specific too, so that's that's important. So again, host identification is is key. So if you've got a hundred tree diseases in the United States, or hundreds of tree diseases in the United States, all different shapes, colors, sizes. Um, a particular tree species might only have 15 known diseases, again, in, in the United States. Um, but when you pair that down to a regional perspective, you might only have two or three diseases that are common for a species in a given geographical area like the Northeast. So then you add to that, you know, visual inspection and pattern of abnormality. It's pretty much a piece of cake, but it all starts with knowing what species you're looking at. Site inspection is really important. The site on, that a tree grows on uh, is key to a tree's vigor. And I'm going off track a little bit here, but but vigor and susceptibility or vigor and, and resistance are, are, they go hand in hand. If a tree's not vigorous, it doesn't matter, you know, if on paper it's, uh, resistant to Dutch elm disease and, and resistant doesn't mean immune but you know if there's a if there's a Dutch elm disease resistant tree on a really bad site and then therefore the tree is not vigorous it can still get Dutch elm disease and I've 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 isolated Dutch elm disease on disease resistant elms growing on bad sites enough times to know that 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 works um, so so tree vigor is really important in, in the picture of insect and disease and it's dictated by site and tree care to some extent, if we're talking about the, the, the homeowner, landowner uh, type situation. So anyway, site broadly describes all the conditions in a local area where a tree is grown and health and vigor are determined by site factors. But species, again, also comes into play. This is a planting that was exposed to a pretty si significant drought. Over here, we have Siberian larch. And in this row, we have also plant at the same time, taken care of in the exact same way. We've got uh, native uh, North American larch in this uh, this row, and you can see the difference. So um, you know, there's combat, there's compatibility. You know, this is sort of plays into the right tree in the right place. You can't plant a, a tr like a like a European weep weeping birch in a, a really drought prone area, because if you do, it's going to become highly attractive to bronze birch borer, and then you get this top down, outside in pattern of damage from, from bronze birch borer. So other site factors that you can take into account are soil type. Um, I'd say pH is a really important factor there. Uh, climate, microclimate, 
a tree grown in one area can be very differently affected um, by something compared to a tree that's grown 10 feet away. It, and that's mostly, uh, you know, maybe a winter hardiness. If you, if you have like a nice little warm corner uh, closer to a house, a tree might be much more successful there than its neighbor of the same variety planted on the same day under the same conditions, you know, 10 feet away where it's a little bit more exposed to wind. Um, and that sort of plays into landforms too. Um, just the way that water flows in, in a on a landscape, you think about like a like a stand of hemlocks or something like that where, you know, moisture conditions might be really great. The hemlocks might be doing really well and then some kind of human caused disturbance or something changes the, the flow dynamics of, of the water on the landscape. All of a sudden those trees get a little bit less water and then being a little bit more susceptible to to or to to changes, uh, you might start to see some decline. Um, disturbance history. Again, we talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, soil disturbance, uh, any kind of uh, digging or soil compaction can all, all have an effect. And again, how does the lawn look? Always think about herbicides. People use a lot of herbicides in and around their homes and sometimes irresponsibly. And even when you try to use them responsibly, you can still uh, have make mistakes. I was spraying for poison ivy. I thought I was doing a really great job at my house and I had this pretty little oak tree that was coming up in the understory and I hit it and uh, it's uh, it might make it through, but at this point I really don't know. Uh, but it's uh, it's important to always be very careful with your herbicides. Again, site inspections. Um, in addition, many site problems may include physical or chemical injuries. And here we've got chemical injuries. Um, on this side here, we've got uh, some de-icing product that was put on this sidewalk that splashed up and has, has had uh, a bad effect on these on these trees. If this was up higher, if the brown was up higher and it was green lower, I'd think it was winter burn. But because of its proximity to the sidewalk and, and being lower on the plant, <coughs> excuse me, it, uh, it uh, very likely chemical injury due to salt. Here we have a newly poured um, sidewalk next to a new building oftentimes and concrete is is very alkaline substance and and, and runoff on concrete and new uh, and from new construction can really change um, the ph of soil in the immediate in the immediate vicinity of these these uh, man-made structures so this is a situation that very likely caused um, by alkalinity in the soil alkalinity uh, or very high ph um, low acidity, uh, it can make iron un unavailable to, to trees. There's plenty of iron in the soil, but the, the, the chemical relationships that occur in the soil make the, the iron not available to the trees. And that's why you get this yellowish type of foliage. All, all things related to site. We saw this, this diagram before. So many tree pr uh, problems in urban residential sites um, and, and also in the forest, uh, you know, oftentimes you see trees that are next to logging roads in poor condition or skid trails because, well, maybe they've been hit by uh, by a tree or two and there's some damage to the, the basal uh, portions of the tree, but they can also suffer from, from the uh, compaction of soil, depending upon when the logging was done. But anyway, in the urban, uh, urban environment, recent excavation, construction, chemical use, soil compaction, mechanical injuries, physical in energy, uh, in injuries all have, uh, have negative impacts on, uh, on, tr on trees and really want to stress the compatibility of, of a tree to site and, and doing our best to take care of uh, the tree's needs. Assessing the pattern of abnormality, this really helps us differentiate between environmental or abiotic non-living factors that cause problems in trees versus biotic factors, which would be the insect disease um, uh, aspects of, of tree health. So damage caused by environmental and abiotic factors tend to be expressed throughout the entire tree. They tend to be expressed in more than one tree and in more than one species. And I'll have some examples here for you. Abiotic. So you've got many different trees here, different species of trees and shrubs, and they're all dead. And the the, the reason is obvious. The, they've their root zones have been inundated with water. They've had no uh, they've had anoxic conditions at the root level, and they've they've all died. Um, 
pretty straightforward. Here's another abiotic, abiotic uh, situation where you've got several trees, several different species, all dead. What's the reason? There was actually a, a ground fire that went through this area and uh, killed all these trees. They're fairly young trees, thin bark trees, and the fire had a had a pretty uh, pretty uh, uniform effect on the stand, killing killing everything. This is a picture that I took when I was in. I didn't take this actually. It was a colleague that took this and shared this with me. This was from North Dakota, um, and uh, you've got next to a next to a field, some kind of a agricultural production field, and you've got a lot of mature trees of different uh, ages, sizes, species, etc., and they're all in various states of being dead. <laughs> and the reason for that is uh, they use herbicide quite a bit on some of those farm fields and um, in this particular situation they were spraying it aerially and North Dakota is a pretty windy windy spot so the wind blows in the wrong direction when you're laying down chemical on, on your crop you can have disastrous results like this but again the main idea is multiple trees multiple species same symptomology abiotic pur purposes here's winter burn um, happening in a about the same geographical area, but you've got um, the same symptoms on four different species here, um, expressing a little bit differently, but the the same thing is as happened here. It's winter burn. These tick pictures were all taken in spring. They're all taken uh, uh, different species of conifers in, in different different settings. So again, assessing the pattern pattern of abnormality, damage caused by insect and path pests tend to be sporadic so it's a here and there pattern and that is because how I meant I mentioned this at the beginning of the presentation insects and pathogens are specialists and that's important to always remember that they they have a narrow host range and it's restricted to one or a few closely related species and it's specific to tree parts and tissues tree tissues so here's two examples of a biotic um, disorder here we have um, sporadic here and there. It looks like it's more concentrated at the top, but you can see there's there's uh, blighted tips um, here, and that's uh, diplodia tip blight. And here we have, again, a here and there pattern. You've got little blighted uh, branch tips of a crab apple tree, and this is caused by fire blight. And the unfortunate situation with fire blight is that it's, it's really contagious. So in the spring, the fire blight cankers that uh, overwinter on branches, they start to produce a sticky sugary liquid that bees will often um, visit and get coated with the bacteria. And then they go and visit different flowers. Um, and every time they do so, they expose a new uh, flower to the bac bacteria, which, you know, invades the invades the, the tip of the branch and causes these, these blights. And this can be also very easily spread by people who try to prune these out. They see a dead branch and say, oh, I don't like the looks of that, I'm gonna prune it out. If they don't prune for, far enough back on the branch to avoid getting bacteria on their clipper and then they go clip something else or then they go you know, do some pruning on a different apple tree, they can spread the disease uh, very efficiently all over and, and really um, have, have disastrous, disastrous results. Um, here's, <coughs> excuse me, another biotic situation, and this really follow, follows a pattern. Um, so here we have various blighted, not blighted, but uh, various affected twigs or branch tips at the top of a poplar tree, and uh, this is uh, caused by poplar borer. And the boring insects, much like emerald ash borer, they, they tend to work from the top down. So. Um, the boring insects, they work from the top down. Here we have Cytospora canker on spruce. The fungi tend to work from the bottom up. And the reason bottom up is because there's the, the relative humidity in this area is always gonna be higher, almost always, than up here. Because there's more wind, more, more drying of branches more quickly. So if the relative humidity is higher for longer periods of time down here, that's gonna be more conducive to infection by fungi because fungi need free water for developing their spore producing structures for disseminating the spores for the spores to survive being disseminated then when they land on susceptible host material they have to germinate which they also require water for 
and they really need that water until they can get you know invade host tissue and start using the resources of their host so that's that's in a nutshell why when you see diseases they often tend to be in the lower part of the tree and work their way up i don't know why insect why the insect bores why they start high and, and go low but i don't know maybe in Entomologists can in, inform us better on that in a, in a future presentation, but that's just a general patterns that are followed. So number four is inspect the functional parts of the tree. Um, and these functional parts that I'm going to focus on here are leaves and needles. So obviously there's something wrong with the, the, the functional parts uh, pictured in each of the pictures here. So here we have some cupping of leaves. Um, that's abnormal growth, definitely. There's some grow, uh, leaves that are growing normally here. This happens to be a hackberry, which we don't have a ton of here in, in uh, Maine, but um, uh, the cup, the cupping very uncharacteristic and very suggestive of uh, herbicide use. Whenever you have cupping and twisting of foliage, uh, oftentimes it's related to herbicide. <laughs> And sometimes it's really obvious like this. Sometimes you have to take a, a hand lens or maybe even a microscope and look for stuff like this. So these are the fruiting structures of uh, stigmina needle cast of spruce. And so these, you know, erupt through the epidermis and, and produce spores. It, um, this may be the only uh, sign that you can find on the tree because other infected needles have already been cast. They've already dropped off. So uh, sometimes you need to search for for uh, you know f ed evidence of fungus on a needle here we've got uh, um, bladder gall uh, mite uh, caused by areophyte mites they inject uh, uh, chemicals into the leaves that uh, sort of hijack the the growth hormones of, of the of the tree and the tree um, produces these uh, these galls that the, the, the mites use for uh, carrying out their, their life cycles. Um, interestingly, this is one of the more severe cases of bladder gall that I've seen, but even if, if, even if you have a leaf like this, you still have a lot more green than you do uh, bladder gall. And uh, it's very, very often, this is just an aesthetic issue. People really want to spray for it because they don't want to see these warty things on their, on their trees. But I always remind people that you know, there are predators of, of areophyte mites that cause this. And uh, if you, and those predators reproduce at a much slower rate than the areophyte mites. So applying chemical at this time is really going to set your tree back because you're going to be killing the predatory insects that will bring this type of a, a situation into check. So uh, using, using pesticides, uh, insecticides in a situation like this for something that's not typically going to uh, harm a tree in the long run. Uh, I always advise people against that. Here we have that iron chlorosis. Maple is, is particularly susceptible to iron chlorosis. Um, again, there's plenty of, of plenty of iron in the soil, but the tree just can't get it uh, because of high alkalinity or, or very basic soils. Uh, here we have Dutch elm disease. This is called a flag. You've got these, these branch tips that are wilting. It's kind of an indication uh, to the, the observer that there's definitely something wrong here. Uh, here we have some blotches on the leaves and some a little bit of chlorosis there too, but looks like some frog eye leaf spot here uh, that's that's developing. And per perhaps here too, could be apple scab. Um, this is on a, a crab apple tree. And here we have something that's a little bit mysterious. It wasn't chemically related, um, could have been uh, due to mites. Uh, possibly due to uh, a phytoplasm, but uh, never really figured it out. But uh, anyway, looking at the looking for signs of abnormality when you inspect functional parts of trees, uh, very important. Looking at again at the foliage, uh, is it chlorotic? Is it wilted? Is it curled? Is it too small? Um, sometimes when you have small leaves, that's an indication that the first set of leaves was cast because of disease. That happens a lot with ash and ash anthracnose. When there's a heavy infection of ash anthracnose, little purple spots develop on the leaves and the ash tree might decide that it's going to shed all of its leaves and start new. Um, that's really, in terms of energy, very expensive for the tree, but um, it, the tree does that to sort of protect itself. The, the, the subsequent flush of leaves that was often 
quite a bit noticeably smaller than the, than the first flush. So something like that may happen or it just may be that the tree's not in really great health for other reasons and that may lead to having leaves that are a little bit smaller. Here's chlorosis. Here's again those areophyid mites and here is fire blight on ketoniaster. You can see this shepherd's crook. The leaves are are dry. They look like they've wilted a little bit before they died and that's very typical for fire blight. Again looking close to the at the, the growths, looking close for growths or spots on needles. So this is what a healthy needle is supposed to look like. And this is the same type of needle, a spruce needle, with uh, fungal fruiting structures on it. Um, the spores are produced from these little little the black spots or masses of fungus, and uh, that's how the disease gets around. Uh, these are uh, fruiting structures as well. Every D different fungi have different different shaped and sized fruiting structures and the way we tell the way we understand what we're dealing with is by one looking at these fruiting structures and then also looking at spores here's dothostroma needle blight um, and that's what the here's a spore producing structure erupting from the epidermis it starts out with banding like this and then you get the spot and then you get the erupted uh, fruiting structure sort of like the progression of symptoms there that I was talking about earlier in the presentation. And then I also look at uh, re reduced needle retention, but also growth. I'll talk about growth a little bit later, um, but here's the following year's growth in the bud. That's going to, you know, in spring there, you know, the buds are going to break and there's going to be a flush of new growth, but this is current year's growth. This is last year's growth. You can tell by where the, where the buds or the terminal bud scars are. Um, here's growth from three years ago, and here's growth from four years ago and five years ago. Um, and you can see there are no needles on this older growth. The third, three years ago, there's a lot of infected needles that are probably going to fall off pretty soon. Here you have about half the needles are infected, but these needles next year are going to look like this, and this growth here is going to look like this next year. So this is a, an example of reduced needle retention. It's important to sort of know how to look at a tree and understand its uh, its annual growth. Um, and uh, you can sort of reconstruct what's happening based on, on, on this. Spots or lesions, so here's septoria leaf spot. Um, Linden leech blo leaf blotch, which is not really common in Maine. Um, here's oak anthracnose, which was extremely heavy last year. I got lots of calls about oak anthracnose. Uh, where it causes deformation of leaves and e even quite a bit more severe symptoms than are shown here. Um, and this is ash anthracnose. Um, and that was what I, that I was, that's what I was just talking about. It causes these little, this, this little spot here um, is an early infection, early infection, uh, early infection. And eventually those areas will look like this as they cause the, the death of leaf, leaf tissue. Um, as the leaf expands and it causes these deformations. Insects, so um, um, ash leaf bug, dogwood sawfly, pear slug sawfly, fall webworm. You know, it's insects, I mean, no offense entomologists, but it's, it's a little bit more obvious. You know, you have these, you have these critters, these creatures, these insects, uh, walking around on leaves, eating foliage, making big, big ugly nests. Um, it's, it's, uh, it can be sometimes a little bit more straightforward to make a diagnosis when you're dealing with with pests like this. Um, also, look at fruit, abnormal fruit. Um, here we have an abnormal fruit. This is a plum, and this is a, a normal fruit that somehow isn't affected. Um, but this is a disease called plum pockets that causes uh, this you know, something like this to look like a, you know, roasted marshmallow. It uh, forms these big pockets with air spaces in them and it just sort of blows up the fruit and um, other diseases like uh, this is Botryosphera uh, on, on crab apple cause mummification of fruits. And this is where the next year's infections are gonna come from. And here we have a rust fungus on a service berry. Um, so, seeing different seeing the, these rust pustules on the berry um, should give you a pretty good idea of what you're dealing with this is you know pretty pretty obvious stuff too but they are signs or symptoms and signs that uh, tell us what we're dealing with 
inspection of the, the functional parts of the tree, the branches and shoots. So you look for things like exit holes from insects. This is uh, native ash, uh, uh, na native ash bark beetle, um, very common. Here's a bronze birch borer on, on birch. Um, this is an emerald ash borer. And here we have a uh, some kind of a canker on spruce. I don't know which canker that is, but it is a canker on spruce. And then you have something like this, which is by caused by sap sucker. And this is actually on, a, on an elm, um, a Japanese elm, but it's a uh, sap sucker as the, these very like neat rows of, of pits that are excavated by the sap sucker that will come and revisit the tree and drink the sap, eat some insects that are collect that are attracted to the sap as well. Um, they can sometimes be really hard on trees, the sap suckers. It's not just insects and diseases. It's, you know, sometimes animals as well, as many of you know. Uh, you look for flagging branches. So you've seen these pictures before. Discolored branches, wilted branches, all good examples. This is an indication. It's sort of the, the tree's way of waving to you and saying, hey, there's something wrong in this general area. Come check it out. Look closer and you'll find out what it is. Um, Shoot growth is, again, something that I have to sometimes remind myself to check, but it can be very telling. And this is a, a very old picture that I, I, I got from a, a colleague when I was out in the Midwest. And he this was a case where he, um, you know, used annual growth to, to try to figure out, you know, uh, try to diagnose a disorder in tree. So you've got the, the comparison here, this is the growth in a, in a neighboring tree of the same species in 2003. Well, it's quite a bit less in 2003, 2002, 2001. But you look at 2000, 2000, the, the growth is pretty, pretty similar. So, you know, you ask the you ask the the landowner what happened one, two, three, somewhere between three and four years ago that might have caused um, a abrupt sort of reduction in growth. So this is a way that you can reconstruct history in a way. Um, you know, look around, you see if there's any evidence of disturbance, or maybe the person says, "Oh uh, yeah, my, uh, you know, my, um, uh, we re we re redid the so sidewalk at the, you know, in the fall of 2000, and uh, we had to cut a lot of roots from that tree, but uh, we didn't think it was going to be a big deal. Well, that that'd be a, a real good indication of what happened, what sort of caused the slowdown in growth. So again, this is with hardwoods, uh, with, uh, with the softwoods. Here's the first year needles, second year needles, third year needles. And way to, way to look at annual growth. Very good skill to have when you're diagnosing disorders in trees. Another thing to consider is when did shoots die? Again, this goes, on, goes along with phenology. Uh, some of those questions to ask landowners at the beginning uh, that, I, that I went over. Um, this obviously this is healthy here but this this tip was blighted fairly soon after bud break um so was this tip on spruce this was actually uh, frost damage um, this is diplodia tip blight uh so these happened very early on in the year this was succulent new growth real exposed to cold temperatures and it sort of just wilted and died um as opposed to this this is fire blight it's a disease that stays active throughout the year um, and this, you know, affected the 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 host after fruit was fully, you know, after flowering and fruit was was all, um, you know, all formed. Uh, this this uh, branch was blighted. So important information to to make note of for sure. Okay, inspecting the functional parts of the tree, main stem, roots, and root collar. We talked about girdling roots. Um, this is not a great example of a girdling root, but when a root grows over another root like this, and here you got another root growing over, and you got this root right here that's kind of growing over a main root, plus you got a basal basal scar. None of this stuff really helps the tree, um, you know, maintain vigor. Uh, so uh, it's uh, it's it's something that you want to keep an eye on. And again, planting a tree right when at, at the at the get go is usually a the, the best way to prevent, you know, the girdling roots and the roots that grow. This this is more of a girdling root. These roots are just kind of constricting main main uh, main structural roots. 
Here are some some trees that were cut down and pulled out because they had terrible girdling roots and the trees were not doing well. They're, they're kind of planted in a confined um, planting spot, so they didn't. They're urban trees, so they didn't have really great opportunities to expand. This kind of looks like there's something wrong, right? There's some weeping and oozing. This is a bacterial canker of uh, Ohio buckeye, and. Uh, you can definitely tell there's something wrong with this part of the tree. There's some staining and some oozing of liquid. Here's Utapella canker, which is pretty common here in, in Maine in the, in the forest environment um, where, you know, there's obviously something wrong. This is kind of a target shaped canker. I don't know if you can see the concentric lines, but it's uh, definitely uh, something to be concerned about. Um, it's also a structural, structural compromise, structurally compromised part of the tree. Uh, here's the crown gall that I was talking about earlier, the agrobacterium. So this is a almost like a uncontrolled growth of tree cells. It's it's a a punky sort of soft, tumorous growth uh, that's initiated by agrobacterium, the agrobacterium plasmid, and it, it causes this. And here are just some kind of here's a, here's a weeping canker. This is a little bit more. Uh, a little bit more discreet and you have this kind of big diffuse canker diffuse meaning that doesn't have like really neat margins so this has sort of concentric nice neat rings and the trees kind of trying hard and doing pretty well to keep the infection at bay so you have this kind of neat um, pattern of, of canker formation whereas this you just have the canker the fungus just growing wild and it's not really being held in check by by the tree at all, and this is a very, very serious situation. And I never figured out what canker this was, unfortunately. But, um, and that's, you know, that's the nature of this work. You can't, you can't figure everything out. Sometimes you don't have enough information. Sometimes you don't have the right tools to be able to figure everything out. But this, this gets us pretty close. And here's some more cankers. This is thousand cankers of black walnut. Um, which, you know, this is not that big deal, but they call it thousand cankers because you get thousands of these cankers that are callousing up uh, and sort of girdling the tree. You, you get uh, pretty drastic reductions in health. Here's a, a fire blight canker on um, buckthorn, not buckthorn, um, hawthorn. Here's some more root damage, some damage by flooding. Here's planted too low, it's not going to grow. This is a cedar that's been planted way too deep and was starting to show some crown issues. Here's some uh, a root damage and some, some, here's a nice girdling root that's working its way around the tree. So it's also important to know what's normal. So, you know, some, some trees look funny because that's what they were selected for in the, the nursery trade. So you got to know what's normal, so you know what's abnormal. Um, and, and again, you, you once you notice symptoms, you sort of trace them backwards on the tissue and try to find signs. And sometimes it's very easy, and sometimes it's a little bit more difficult. Um, so signs are types of insects. Um, and the way you know what an insect is, is you make note of the body shape, you look where it's feeding, you look at the color, different patterns uh, of feeding. Um, yeah, types of fungal growth or fungal growths, anything that looks unusual, you compare them to healthy trees and uh, you can, again, get clues to what's going on. Important to locate reputable uh, resources to help you make these calls. So you can have books, you can look at websites. I would really be cautious of some websites. I'd, you know, I would rely on, you know, of course, the main forest service resources that we're working on. I'm trying to update all, a lot of our fact sheets right now. So stay tuned for that. But also, you know, have some good field guides. Um, I would say with websites, concentrate on, on university extension websites. They tend to be, be very good. Um, and people like me and the entomologists here, I mean, that's the reason that we're here. We're here to, you know, monitor, not only monitor the, the, the health of Maine's forest resources, but also to help people uh, that have sick trees or have uh, insect and disease issues with uh, uh, their, their wood lot or, or even, you know, some, some trees on their property. So I've tried to go through this and I'm, I'm, a little bit over time, but I just wanted to go through a little quiz and then there'll be some time for questions. Um, so here is the crime scene. 
So everybody think about this, look at it, observe everything that you can, and I'll help you out with some slides here. So what is going on here? We got some, definitely there's some spruce that are dead. It looks like they're dying. And there's some oaks nearby, and eh, there's some, probably something wrong with the oak foliage here. This looks kind of a little bit different. There's some brown foliage over here. So we look at that and we identify the species. Okay, it looks like there's oak is in, infected here. Gosh, there was a there was a uh, box elder that that's showing some cupping and twisting and some strange venation patterns. The white pine new growth is is very odd, and the spruce uh, new growth is twisted and looking funky. So we've got multiple species in the same location, multiple trees. So we're probably thinking it's something abiotic, right? Look at the site again, and we're assessing, assessing the pattern of abnormality. The symptoms are pretty much uniformly stressed or expressed throughout the tree. Again, I don't know why that slide was repeated. This was herbicide. This was somebody's attempt to control some poison ivy. They were a little bit too haphazard with the, the, the sprayer and they, they hit a lot of stuff that was that they didn't intend to hit and they killed some trees. Um, so that's uh, that's that's number one. Here's number two. What's wrong with this tree? Is this normal? What's the first step? Species identification. Um, it is a red pine, apparently. Um, we're looking at the, the site. This looks like it's a lawn. So we're doing the site inspection. Is this normal? No, this is not normal. Um, are symptoms expressed throughout the entire tree? Yep, probably abiotic then, unless you know there's something else that we're missing. Site inspection, okay, this is a lawn. Looks like it's being cared for pretty well. We examine the functional parts of the tree and we see that at the base, there's some lawnmower blade. So again, abiotic, um, somebody either weed whacked this a little bit uh, too aggressively and, and got part of the tree or somebody hit it with a lawnmower. Okay, <clears throat> what's wrong with these trees? What's the first step? We identify the species. We've got poplar, we've got dogwood. Here's the dogwood, here's the poplar. And uh, we look, okay, there's multiple species showing the same symptoms. It's pretty uniform throughout the, the crown. Is it normal? Definitely not. We do the site inspection and we notice that uh, there's pretty normal grass here, but why is all the grass here stone cold dead, except for this little patch? Um, then we start asking questions of you know people in the area about this, the site history, and we later learn that there was a giant pile of road salt that was being stored um, next to the road, and it sort of, as it rained and as the, the spring melt came, uh, the this this salinity all washed down into this low area and we had really high salts and that's what you get. Um, trees that uh, die or are severely stressed from from road salt. What's wrong with this shrub? What's the first step? We identify it as spirea. It's actually normal for this uh, this shrub because uh, this is a cult of cultivar of spirea that's supposed to be really chlorotic to add some color to your landscape. OK, what's wrong with this tree? What's the first step? Red pine, pattern of abnormality. We do the site inspection. It's sort of like an open grown forest with some some sod competition, but I don't think that's probably, you know, if it was more of a sod competition or, you know, abiotic issue. I'd expect to see more uniform um, symptoms throughout the crown. Uh, we know the species is red pine. Uh, it's sporadic. We, accept, we assess the functional parts of the tree. Here we've got a healthy shoot. We've got a dead shoot, died early. We look more closely at the umbo of the cone. We see these little black spots in these little areas where the, the epidermis of the, the cone umbo is opening up. And in each one of those little openings is a little spore producing structure, produces a, a fairly large spore that's dark. Um, very easy to scrape some of the spores out, put them on a slide and confirm that we've got Diplodia shoot blight. It's actually tip light. I got to change that slide, but it's still a blight. Um, and finally, what's wrong with this tree? We identify it. This is some kind of a, some kind of a fruit tree growing in somebody's yard. Obviously, something's eaten on the leaves. Um, it's sporadic. Um, 
and we will take a little bit closer look. We see these small things that almost could be mistaken for bird droppings or something. Uh, take a closer look and it's pear slug sawfly eating your hawthorn bushes. So with that, I believe I'm ending one minute early, so there is time for questions. So if you have any questions for me, please unmute your microphone at this time and uh, ask away.